All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for the first Michigan Audubon sponsored webinar. Um, I'm Lindsay Kane and I'm the education coordinator at Michigan Audubon. Uh, today's topic will focus on identifying water birds in flight, which can be quite an intimidating experience. Um, but before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to go over a few logistics for everyone. Um, there are two ways that you may be joining us live today, either through Zoom or through our Facebook feed. Um, any questions that you have can be sent to us through the Q&A box on the Zoom um, or through the comments section on Facebook. Um, there are Michigan Audubon staff members who are monitoring both of those. We'll work to answer as many, possible, many questions as possible at the end um, when Allison is done with her presentation. And if we don't get to any, then we'll follow up with those later. Um, for now, I would like to introduce Allison Villa. Um, Allison joins us from Whitefish Point Bird Observatory, which is a program of Michigan Audubon. Um, she's the current Outreach and Education Coordinator, and in addition to helping with this year's fall water bird count, she has been the water bird counter at WPBO for the last three seasons, which means she has spent many hours in the harsh elements on the shore of Lake Superior counting water birds in both the spring and summer, or spring and fall seasons. Um, and as I mentioned before, identifying water birds in flight can be quite intimidating. Um, it's also challenging and exhausting. Um, the many, many birds that Allison has identified and counted make her a little bit of a magician in my book. Um, <laughs> but today, Allison is going to help us learn some valuable tips for identifying those water birds in flight. And uh, without further ado, I will hand this over to Allison. Hi, thank you for joining. As Lindsay said, my name is Allison Vlog, and I work at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory. Whitefish Point is located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It's on Lake Superior, and it's a program of Michigan Audubon. We have this incredible water bird migration at Whitefish Point, and I have been very lucky for three seasons to conduct the water bird count here. And doing that has really um, made me, it's really improved my field skills in identifying water birds in flight. And it's also really driven home how fun it is to work through this sort of birding. I just love the feeling of scanning and picking up a flock of migrating ducks and just that rush of the element of challenge, knowing that I have a very short time to work with them before they're gone and identify them and sifting through that is just one of my favorite types of birding. Right now it's mid-September and water birds are really starting to migrate. So it's a great time to learn a little bit about water bird identification and prepare to go out in the field and give it a try. And to make this presentation, I had a few goals. I wanted to reduce the intimidation factor of lake watching. That's just one of those things that does have a fairly high learning curve. And I was hoping to share some of the things that I've learned with you all. And I also wanted to drive home how fun it is to go out and lake watch and have an idea of what you're looking for. And in creating this presentation, I designed it and Michigan Audubon also assisted me with this so that we could make it possible for you to access after the fact. It is a little bit information dense. And I know that I could not retain everything that we're going to talk about today. So I think it's great that you will be able to refer back to it and hopefully um, just really ingrain things that we learned today that you find helpful. While we're on the topic of resources, I wanted to mention one in particular that's been very helpful to me as I have just improved my lake watching skills and this book is the Peterson Sea Watching Guide. It is probably the best guide along this vein that exists. There's really great photos that just show well the sort of conditions and the sort of looks that you're going to have when you're water bird watching and in fact some of those photos were taken at Whitefish Point which I think is really cool and the accompanying text is just very very helpful it points out things that you should be looking for and if this is something that you see yourself getting seriously interested in i really recommend you pick up sea watching um, when i'm working up here at whitefish point i usually use it as a reference several times a week so 
As far as the format of this presentation goes, I thought that it would be best to break it down into four parts, the four things that I look at when I'm working water bird identifications. And we're going to look at flock structure, at the flight style, at the shape of the bird, and then also at any contrast that you see in the plumage. So the first thing that I look at with a water bird flock that's approaching is the flock structure. Some water birds fly in lines, other ones fly in clumps or balls, and this is a useful distinguishing factor. And it's also helpful to look at how these birds are flying. Some birds, like the white-winged scoters that are pictured here, they like to stay in place. They don't shift around a lot. Other birds, like teal, will move around a lot in their flock while flying, and just getting that general impression of the flock can help point you in the right direction. Once I've gotten a sense of the flock, the next thing I take a look at is the flight style. For example, some water birds have really deep wing beats, others have shallow wing beats, and also the flight height is something that's useful. You can look at whether the birds are flying high above the water, some birds prefer to do that, and then others, like teal and bufflehead, will oftentimes be just barely over the waves. In fact, you sometimes lose them inside the swells, and those are useful as well for just narrowing down what sorts of birds you might be looking at. After I've gotten a sense of the flock and the um, flight style, the next thing that I look at is the structure of the bird. This is probably the single most helpful thing in water bird counting. And things that I pay attention to, for example, I look at the wings. Are they broad or are they narrow? Mallards have really broad wings. Pintails have really narrow wings. And this applies to a lot of different water birds, that difference. Another thing I look at is whether or not their feet trail behind loons and grebes in flight because their feet are so back, far back on their body, their feet actually trail out behind them. And this is a really useful feature. The last thing that I look at is plumage. It's actually not that helpful in a lot of water bird count scenarios, which can be really frustrating because it looks great in the field guide, but once you actually get out in the field and the light is not what you want it to be, or the birds are flying at an angle where, for example, you can't see the upper part of the wing, it's really frustrating to try to be pointing and um, looking specifically for plumage details. So what I try to look for instead is patterns of contrast. Where are the light areas of the bird? Where are the dark areas, areas of the bird? And occasionally you will get a better look where you can get that killer look that's depicted in the field guide. But a lot of the time it really just goes back to looking for contrast and figuring out what that might mean. So with this format of looking first at flock structure, at the flight style, at the general shape, and then the contrast, we're going to apply this to some of the water birds that we see migrating most frequently on the Great Lakes and especially at Whitefish Point because that's just where I have the most experience and the most photos from. So we will start with dabblers. Dabblers fly in great big messy flocks and those flocks are fun because they oftentimes compare more than one species or contain more than one species of duck. For example, you can have a lot of widgeon flying with a gadwall and just working through that flock to see what is different is for me, a really fun challenge, and I hope it will be for you as well. As far as the flight style, dabblers move really quickly. They have fast wing beats, and it's not often that you have a very long time to work with a particular flock. And for ducks, they're sturdy bodied and they're large winged. In this picture, we have blue winged teal and American widgeon, and that's just a classic example of water bird species flying together. You'll notice that the teal are a lot smaller than the widgeon. So to look specifically at some of the dabblers that we have, I thought we would start with one that is very familiar and that is the mallard. In a mixed flock, mallards will oftentimes be out in front of the other birds in that flock. They sort of lead the flock. And for a dabbling duck, they have a more direct flight. They're not going to be twisting around as much as for example, a teal and they also have slower wing beats than a lot of the dabblers. 
They're one of the only ducks that I sometimes get a quick look at and think for a moment that it's a goose. And that's just because of their large size and also because when they're flying, they angle upward a little bit, which to me is reminiscent of a goose. Another thing that I've noticed with mallards is that they look around a lot more than other ducks when they're flying. They'll look up, they'll look down, and even at a large distance, this is something that stands out a lot and is useful to have in your toolbox. Moving into the finer points of mallard identification, as far as size and shape go, they're just a big duck. In fact, they are one of our biggest ducks. They're sturdy, they're long-necked, they're long-winged, and when they're flying, especially with other ducks, they just look very substantial. At a distance, you are not going to get a lot of contrast on a mallard. The underwings are a little bit paler than the rest of the bird, and with the right light, you can see that there's white bordering that patch on their wings. And they also do have white on the outer tail feathers, which is pretty unique for a duck. American black duck is one that's a lot less common than a mallard, but I thought it was worth mentioning because they are quite a bit similar. Mallards are actually a little bit bigger than a black duck, and the biggest difference is that they're darker bodied and they have those light underwings. The next large dabbler that we're going to look at is Northern Pintail. They are one of my favorite ducks at Whitefish Point. They're just beautiful in all aspects of their plumage, of their structure, and even of their flight. And I really love having our big pintail flights here. They're also, because of this sleek look, they're a lot easier to identify and pick out at a distance, you know, pretty quickly after you get on pintail, that that's what you've got. They form really neat lines, which is unique amongst the other dabblers. They will, it's really rare that you see them in big clumps. And as far as their flight goes, it's a lot more direct than the other dabblers. It's powerful. They seem to have an idea of where they're going and they go there quickly. The shape of a northern pintail is really, really beautiful. Um, I've always called them the greyhound of dabblers, and I know that I'm not alone in using that term. I wish I had come up with it, but I haven't. They are just long and lean in every aspect of their structure. Their wings, their neck, their body even, they're not as round as your other dabblers. Pintail, as we know, in the male, they have this beautiful long tail. Don't look too long for that when you're deciding whether or not you have pintail, because at any distance, it doesn't really show up well, and you're not going to see it, so you might be misled by that. Again, at a distance, pintails really don't have a lot of contrast. They just appear warm brown. If they're close, you'll see a little white stripe in the secondaries, but again, with pintail, I'm usually not going on plumage. It's more on the shape and those long lines that they form. Another common dabbler that we have at Whitefish Point is the American Widgeon. On our peak flights, we'll sometimes get four or 500 a day in the fall, which I think is really great. American Widgeon are sort of your generic dabbler, or your generic duck for that matter, and basically everything that they do aligns with what I mentioned that most dabblers do. In their flight, they're really disorganized and they oftentimes have other ducks traveling with them. For example, yesterday, it wasn't a fantastic dabbler migration day at Whitefish Point, but every time I had a widgeon, it was flying with another duck. I think I had a mixed flock of widgeon and pintail, a mixed flock of widgeon and teal, and maybe a mixed flock of widgeon and mallard. And so if you do have a big flock of widgeon, good to check and see if there's anything else mixed in with them. Birds tend to clump and shift around a lot in these flights. It's really hard to single out birds and their flight is rapid and usually high. It can be hard to get on with the spotting scope. As far as the size and the shape go for widgeon, they have a really round head, they have a round belly, and then they're more tapered towards the rear. And that's something that shows up pretty well at a distance, that round head, it just looks like it's way bigger than their neck and doesn't join smoothly with the body. Markings are actually something that's pretty useful for American widgeon. Even at a distance, the males have these great big shoulder patches that are white, and they will show up in bad light and long distances, and it's nice that we can have that to rely on. 
The females don't have those big white patches, but they do have lighter, and you can oftentimes tell because they're traveling with males that they're the same shape, they're the same size, they're just female widgeon. Widgeon also have light bellies and their underwings are light, so you have some contrast that's not just in that great big shoulder patch. Our small establers that we have are teal and they are tiny. We had a great big blue wing teal flight at Whitefish Point about two weeks ago. It was really exciting. I had over a thousand in the eight hour count period and it's one of the coolest things that I've seen here. And thinking back on that day, the way that I would describe that flock, those flocks would be balls. We had balls of teal. They're low over the water. They travel in just these very compact pods. They're very hard to count, especially when you have like 75 or 80 of them. And they're clumpy and birds are moving around a lot, switching position and just twisting low over the water. They're one of the ducks that regularly flies actually the closest to the water surface here. And that's a very useful identification feature that I found. As far as their plumage goes, or we'll talk about size and shape first, they're just very, very petite compared to the other ducks. They're tiny and when they do fly with other water birds, you'll know right away, even if you're not sure what kind of teal it is or even what the other birds are, that you're dealing with something and teal because they're just that much smaller. And markings. Blue winged teal, they have a light blue wing patch, which when you go back on your own time and take a look at the photo with the widgeon, you'll see that wing patch. It doesn't show up as well as you'd think it would, but it does show up better than the green on a green winged teal's wing. As you might be able to tell from this photo, this photo was taken at pretty close range. It's not a horrible photo as far as what I've gotten from the water bird count goes, but it's really hard to pick out that green patch on the wing because it's dark and the teal is dark as well. With green winged teal, what you're going to notice is just a small dark bird and you may or may not see that green in the wing. So this covers our most common dabbling ducks. So what we'll move into next is a group of ducks called Athea. They include greater and lesser scop, the redhead, the canvasback, and the ringneck duck. And at Whitefish Point, the ones that we have most frequently are by far the scop and the redhead. So sea watching describes Athea flocks as prone to disintegrate into chaos. And that is a very, very accurate description. The big athea flights at Whitefish Point actually still intimidate me a little bit because you will have thousands of ducks passing by within the eight hour count period. And it's very difficult to count them, to identify them, and also to single out if there's anything else in their flocks just because they're constantly moving around and clumping up into really tight balls and then spreading out and giving you hope that you'll be able to see everything and then they just combine back again. So they're generally shape-shifting messes, and if you pick up one of those flocks on the horizon and just see it moving around a lot, probably Athea. Their flight is really quick, and they also fly pretty high for a duck. As far as their size and shape goes, Scott and Redhead are smaller and smaller wing than the Dabblers. They do look pretty round-headed, but their wings just look a lot more petite in comparison to their body than you get on dabblers. They're fairly round-bellied as well, and markings are useful for showing you that you have athea. It's a little bit more subtle uh, determining whether or not you're dealing with greater or lesser scop, or even sometimes separating, separating redhead. But what is most useful for the contrast on athea is they have dark breasts and light bellies and then towards the vent area the back of the bird is dark as well so you will just get sort of a piebald impression from these flocks when you get on them the wing is what we look at for differentiate differentiating athea from each other greater scop and lesser scop is a really difficult identification you can see from this photo that there's a little white wing stripe on this greater scop with lesser scop, the biggest difference is that their wing stripe is a little bit smaller. And there's a lot of scop that I just leave as unidentified scopspa here, or scop species. 
With the redhead, which is this photo in the lower right that's inset, you can see that they also have a lighter strip in their wings, but it's not the narrow, bright white wing stripe that the scop have. It's more of a broad, silvery stripe. And when you see redhead flying and they're fairly distant, if you were seeing scop at that same distance, you would very easily be able to see that there's a wing stripe. But with redhead, I found myself oftentimes trying to imagine a wing stripe before I realized that there's not one. And that means that I'm probably dealing with redhead. The ring neck duck also don't really have a wing stripe. We don't see great big numbers of them migrating at Whitefish Point, although I know there's other places in the Great Lakes where we do. But they just look fairly puny in comparison to the scop. So moving on from scop, we'll take a look at a duck that has flock shapes that are pretty much everything that scop are not. I love big scoter flights. They form these nice lines of evenly spaced birds and the birds are not moving around a lot. They're very easy to count. And just with the timing of things at Whitefish Point, the athea usually migrate through first in the season and then they're followed by the scoters. And it's like a breath of fresh air to look at a great big line of scoters approaching and think, wow, I'm going to be able to count these. I'm not going to have to estimate. So the scoters are evenly spaced and they stay in place and they have a very powerful flight. The scoters are big ducks and they all, you get this impression from a flock that they are on their way to somewhere. They know how they're going to get there and they're not going to stop along the way. It's very confident and powerful and direct. As far as their size goes, scoters are one of our bigger ducks. They're very robust. They're thick necked. They've got big wings. They've got large bodies. As far as markings go, we have the three scoters. We have white wing scoter, we have black so scoter, and we have surf scoter. White wing scoter is easy. They have these bold white wing patches that stand out pretty well. Sometimes you can see in this photo, I actually put it in intentionally. These are all white wing scoters, but if they're angling towards you, it can be a little bit hard to see that white on the wing. But if you stay with them long enough, you usually do see it. We get lesser numbers of dark wing scoters on the Great Lakes. Surf scoter is the next common after white winged, and then we get very small numbers of black scoters comparatively. This is a trickier identification because they both have dark wings and mostly dark bodies. Black scoter is a little bit smaller than surf scoter, and they are rounder headed, and you're not going to be able to pick that out at a distance. It's actually still an identification that I'm pretty conservative with at the water bird count. But if they're at the close range in good light, there are some plumage details that you can look for. The black scoter has a great big orange knob on its bill in the male. On the left photo, if you're looking, the male is the top bird and you can sort of see that orange at the base of his beak. The female is the bottom bird and she has a paler cheek patch that is very obvious at close range. And surf scoter do not have either of those traits. The surf scoter pictured here to the right are both males, and the males do have that white on the nape that stands out at a pretty good distance, but if light is bad, you're not going to notice it. And they also have great big orange bills. The female, which I don't have a picture of unfortunately, has a couple light dots on her face, and that too is something that you can see at a close distance. So the female has dots and the female black scoter then just has that pale cheek patch. Continuing with our theme of diving ducks, we'll take a look at the long-tailed duck. That's another one of my favorite flight events at Whitefish Point. On our peak days, we will have thousands. I think that some counters have even had like 14,000 in a day before, which is just incredible. And it's usually towards the end of the season. It's like the last big thing to look forward to before winter sets in. But with your flocks of long-tailed ducks, they're oftentimes really big. I've had flocks that have three or 400 birds in them. And these flocks move around a lot. Even if you're looking at an incredible distance or you have a lot of heat distortion to contend with, you're gonna know that you have long-tailed ducks because the lines are just very fluid. They'll string out and then they'll clump back up. They actually fly back and forth in sort of a serpentine fashion. And they also will rise up and undulate. 
as they move across your field of view, the birds shift places frequently. So when you're looking at long-tailed flocks, you just get this feeling of motion in all sorts of dimensions of that flock. Within the flock, the birds have a very twisting flight. They have fast wing beats and they also have a very indirect path of travel. When you look at long-tailed ducks you, and the way that they fly, you have a hard time imagining that they actually make it anywhere. They have long migrations. They nest on the tundra and some of them even winter on the ocean further south. But watching them fly and go back and forth, it's hard to imagine them actually getting anywhere. Long-tailed ducks in shape and size are very round. They have almost a chubby body and a small head. They're sort of a cute duck and they have a small bill as well. Their wings are long and slender and as with the male pintail, male long-tailed ducks do have a nice long tail, but that's going to be difficult to see at a distance. With markings, they're unique because they have all dark wings and light bellies and the males also have some light on the back. And even at a great big distance, you're going to see this contrast because the birds are moving around so much that you'll see the dark back and wings and then they'll turn and you'll see the light bellies. If you look at the birds in the lower right of this photo, I think that's one of the better examples of being able to pick up this contrast at a great distance. And it's something that is very good to look for in the field. We will move on next to some of our more familiar diving ducks. And to do that, we'll start with the common golden eye. Oftentimes we don't see them in great big flocks at Whitefish Point, but when they are flocking, the flocks are sort of an oval shape and the birds maintain their spacing pretty well, like the scoters do. So they seem like less of a mess than for example, the teal that also fly in clumps. They have a really fast direct flight and something that's really cool about the golden eye is that their wings have this really distinctive whistle. And there's been multiple times at the Waterbird count where I've heard this whistle long before I've seen the golden eye and known to look around because there's a flock somewhere. In fact, I think that one of their folk names is Whistler because that refers to that distinctive wing whistle. They're a pretty round duck. They have a great big round head that stands out is quite a bit larger than where it joins the neck. And they're very compact as well. And you're going to see a lot of contrast with the golden eye. They're flashy black and white, and they do have a large white wing patch. A lot of the diving ducks have these black and white patterns, and it's easier to pick out contrast on them than with the dabbling ducks. Bufflehead are one of my favorite ducks to watch migrate. They form these tight balls and they have a very chaotic indirect flight. In a lot of ways, they're similar to the rest of the divers in the same way that teal are similar to the rest of the dabblers. They're tiny, their flocks have the same formations. They fly low over the water and it's almost like watching a little swarm of bees buzz across the surface. As far as their size and shape goes, they're just tiny, tiny, tiny ducks. They're cute. They've got very small heads and really small wings in proportion to their body. And they just look like little balls as they're migrating. The male looks like a little white ball and the female looks like a little dark ball. And the white on the head and the cheek really just stands out. Buffleheads are super distinctive in flight for this reason. And of course, we can't forget the mergansers. Common and red-breasted mergansers are some of the most numerous ducks on the Great Lakes. And deciding that it's a merganser is really not that difficult. Differentiating between common and red-breasted mergansers is a little bit more, uh, there's more nuance to it. But things to think about in general for mergansers is that they will form long lines and there will sometimes be a lot of birds in these lines. And they're not going to clump up as much as a lot of the other ducks. They also have a very shallow wing beat comparatively. If you see them approaching, they don't have the deep wing strokes that mallards, for example, will. And they have a very fast direct flight. They don't meander a lot. 
Mergansers are lanky. They have long necks and long bodies and long beaks, long wings. And they're not quite as elegant as the pintail. They're more of a gangly, long and slender than an elegant. And structure is probably the easiest way to distinguish between red-breasted merganser and common merganser. Red-breasted merganser has a much slimmer neck than the common merganser. The common merganser has, you can see in this lower photo, that its head and its neck seem about the same girth. That's the thing that to me stands out as the best identification feature. On the other hand, red-breasted merganser has a much narrower neck and you can see that the head appears quite a bit larger than where it joins the neck. And that's something that really does stand out. They have large white wing patches, both the common and the red-breasted mergansers, and that's something that stands out as well. <clears throat> so next we'll look at a bird that is not a duck, but because of those white wing patches, it resembles in a lot of ways mergansers. We have redneck grebes. This is one of the coolest migrations that we have at Whitefish Point. We just get huge, huge numbers of them, and they're one of the most numerous birds throughout our water bird count. We had a good flight two days ago. We had about 600, and we've had several flights this season where we've had over a thousand. And what's crazy is that even on those big flight days, you won't have big flocks of grebes. You have just a couple dozen at the most, and because of that, you'll just have a procession of small flocks that are passing by throughout the day. They fly in lines usually, and there's a little bit of place shifting amongst them, but it's not going to be the chaos that you have with teal or with other dab with dabbling ducks. <clears throat> as far as their flight goes, there's a shallow, very frantic wing beat. If you imagine those birds, I don't know the name for them, they're not real birds, but they're lawn ornaments is what they are, and people stick them in their yards, and they have the wings that just frantically twirl around in the wind while the rest of the ornament stays in place. That is what you have with redneck grebes. They have a very frantic wing beat because it's so fast and the rest of their body is very, very level. They fly at sort of a medium height. As far as their size and shape goes, compared to ducks, redneck grebes are long and elongated. They have really long, slim necks and in those regards, they're similar to the mergansers, but their feet do trail out behind them, which gives them a very gangly impression. Their feet are really big, and redneck greaves between the frantic wing beat and the feet trailing out behind, they just look kind of awkward in flight. Horn greaves are in the same family as redneck greaves and similar in several respects, but the easiest difference is that the red or horn greave is just tinier than the redneck greave and they also fly with a very distinctive upright posture. Both the redneck grebe and the horn grebe have white in the wing. Another bird that flies with their feet trailing behind them are loons. And loon migration is another great thing about Whitefish Point. On our big flight days, we can have hundreds of them passing by within the course of a count, and that's something that's just so special to see. Something that's unique about loons in relation to the other water birds is that they don't really flock. On the biggest days, we'll have maybe a dozen that are sort of flying together, but it's a very loose flock. More often, what you're going to see are lone birds or pairs or sometimes threes. Their flight is really direct and powerful and oftentimes quite high, and they're also less intimidated by a headwind than a lot of other water birds. So like the spring, we had a stretch of strong north winds during the peak of loon migration. And loons did slow down, but they were still flying, whereas almost all the other water birds just didn't pass by Whitefish Point during those north winds. Loons have really shallow wing beats. They're long bodied, they have long narrow wings, and they have large feet that trail behind. And those are all really distinctive features that let you know that you are dealing with either a common or a red-throated loon. So common versus red-throated loon is a common identification quandary at Whitefish Point. 
Red-throated loons are a fairly desired bird in Michigan and Whitefish Point is one of the best places to see them. So I oftentimes will have people come out to the water bird count and want to know what you would be looking for. It's actually one of my favorite identifications because it's subtle, but it's also pretty foolproof. When you're thinking about common loons, they have a very steady, balanced flight. They don't move their body around a lot and they just travel in a very straight line. As far as their size and shape go, they're robust, they're pot-bellied, they have big heads, they have big feet that trail out behind them like the grebes do. And you can see also, especially compared to this red-throated loon that's next to it, that common loons have a very stout bill that shows up. The red-throated loon bill is going to disappear when you start getting further and further away from the bird. And as far as plumage goes, it's really difficult to see the neck band on common loons when they're flying far away, but you will notice that they are much higher contrast than a red-throated loon. And this is something that will show up at distance. So there's the common loon for you. Red-throated loon is just generally more petite than the common loon. And once you've gotten experience with these birds, you will be able to see a red-throated loon and just think, wow, that's really small. They do have a similar flight posture to the common loon in that they have long necks and feet that trail out behind the long, narrow wings. But the most distinctive thing to me about red-throated loon flight is the way that they raise and lower their head as they're flying. You can sort of see in this picture on the right that the red-throated loon there is drooping its neck. That's common, and as they droop their neck, they'll raise it back up. It'll droop again, they'll raise it back up. And so you get this image of a red-throated loon in flight where it's flying and also raising and lowering its head. It's one of the best ways to distinguish them from common loon. And they're also compared to common loon, they're a lot flatter bellied, slimmer necked. You're not going to notice that the head looks so big on the neck as it does in common loon. And as I was saying just a moment ago, that bill does disappear at a distance. Their plumage also has a lot less contrast than common loon because they're not black and white, they're more gray and white. So when they're far away or on a common loon, you will be able to see a contrast. A red-throated loon is just going to look like a small gray blob. And that's another good feature for picking them out. <clears throat> So I know that this was a bit of a crash course in water bird identification. It's one of those presentations that I think would probably be easier to give in a situation where we could all be together live and then we could all go out and look for water birds afterwards. But I think it's great that you're going to be able to access this presentation afterwards and hopefully refer to it as you're experimenting with water bird identification this fall, as I hope you will. It really is one of the greatest things about birding in my opinion. And while I'm thinking of it, I do want to thank Hannah Tutangi and Chris Neary and Daryl Lawson. They all contributed photos to this presentation that I didn't have because I realized when I was putting this together that I have definitely not been as diligent as I could be at taking pictures of the birds that I see. Um, I also wanted to mention that Whitefish Point, as you might have figured out by now, has a water bird count and it runs until November 15th. It happens every day and it happens from sunrise to sunset. We have a water bird, or sunrise to sunset. No, it does not do that. <laughs> sunrise for eight hours. We have a water bird counter that's out there and that's going to be Steve Backus this year. He is great and he is more than happy to guide you through his identification process and give you some hands-on field experience. So that's something also that you should consider if you're planning to come to Whitefish Point this fall is you can get some real classroom water bird and flight ID. I put some links that I think you might find helpful in the end of this here. We have Dunkadoo, which is pretty awesome. It's how we manage our data and we enter birds as we see them at Whitefish Point. And it actually provides a live feed of the water bird count. So you can click on it when the water bird count is happening and know exactly what is passing by the point and what Steve is counting as it's happening. Also, um, you can look at seasonal bar charts on eBird and get an idea of what birds are going to be most numerous when. 
and we also do weekly migration blogs to update what's happening at the water bird count and that will be the last link i just really wanted to thank everybody for tuning in and hopefully we'll have some good questions and yeah enjoy fall migration i hope that you go out and see a lot of ducks thanks allison we really appreciate you um doing this for us a lot of really great information. Um, so Linnea Rouse, the conservation science coordinator here at Michigan Audubon has been kind of screening your questions and doing what she can. Um, I'm going to see if she would like to turn on her camera and help us facilitate questions for Allison. Thanks, Lindsay. And thank you, Allison. Great job presenting. Um, we just have a couple of questions here that I uh, like for you to answer here at the end. So um, we'll start out with one, one participant had a question about West Coast birds. Um, she was wondering if you know of or have a recommendation for a book that's specific for Pacific water birds, so for West Coast birders. I don't actually know of a guide. The sea watching guide is definitely more geared for eastern species, although it does include quite a few of the western species. I don't know of anything that's better than that, but I also don't have a lot of direct experience with west coast sea watching. So yeah, I will look into it though, and I will drop a link if I find anything on our Facebook page. Thanks, Allison. And yeah, if you find something, we can also put that on the Whitefish Point um, page. Um, another question is, uh, when is the best time to see bird migration at Whitefish Point? And I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on the differences between spring and fall. For sure. So we'll talk both about time of day and also about time of season. Generally at Whitefish Point, it's better the first couple hours after sunrise. Weather system can switch that up a little bit. For example, if you have a storm move through in the middle of the day, and the winds switch to the direction that you want, and then that can precipitate a really nice migration event. And generally you want tailwinds for the birds in the direction that they're traveling. So a south wind in the spring is good, a north wind in the fall is good. As far as seasonality goes, um, there's a lot we could talk about. Let's start with fall since that's what's happening right now. We are still just kind of reaching the tapering off of the big red neck green flights and dabblers will be the next thing to pick up. They will be really prominent through mid-October and the athea will also pick up in early October and continue to be prominent throughout the month of October. Scoters will be more mid to late October and long-tailed ducks will be like our last big migration event and that's usually around Halloween. And for the last two weeks of the water bird count in November, we still will have long-tailed ducks. And we'll also have our bigger flights of golden eye and bufflehead. I, thinking back to last fall, I had a flight, I think it was November 3rd, where I had over a thousand bufflehead, which was great, but it was also my last big flight of the season because winter really set in. And then um, it's always colder at Whitefish Point than you would expect. So if you do come, make sure that you have a lot of layers and a lot of food <laughs> because I find the water bird count just always makes me hungry. Thinking about spring, I would say that May is probably our best month for water bird migration just in terms of diversity and volume and interest. I really like probably the third week in May when Scoters are really passing through in big numbers, and we also have a big Bonaparte skull flight, which is something that's really beautiful to see. And May is just a good time to be birding anywhere in the Great Lakes. So that's what I would recommend. Thanks, Allison. That was a good uh, elaboration on the differences and kind of suggesting different time periods during the season. For example, right now in the fall, where species are passing through. Yeah. Um, there's another question. Uh, are, do you have any general hints for picking out rarities, something that is not expected, for example, an eider? Yeah, it's one of those things that the more you look at water birds in flight, the more you'll get a sense of what's different. And as far as an eider goes, I haven't seen actually an eider since I left Maine, so <laughs> I'm walking back in memory lane a little bit. 
they're a very, very large duck. They're just going to appear robust and big headed and big bodied. But I think that in a more general light, when you're looking for rarities, you just want to be as familiar as you can with what's normal, because then you'll be able to notice that something is different, which is the first step in figuring out what it is. It's that process of elimination. Yeah, thanks, Allison. So that's all the live questions that I have showing up right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think thank you again to Allison and thank you to all the participants. And I'll turn it back over to Lindsay. Okay, thanks, Linnea. Thanks, Linnea. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate having you. And if you have other questions, feel free to submit them through our Facebook or you can always email us. Um, the best email address is probably birds at michiganaudubon.org um, and we'll get those answered as best as we can. But otherwise, thank you to Allison. Thank you to all of you for joining us and uh, we look forward to more webinars to come. Yeah. Thanks everyone.